Okay. Hello, everybody. We are live from various places uh, around the world. Uh, I know we have a lot of students from very various uh, countries, and I am joined with uh, Hadley Wickham and, of course, Andrew Bay Tran, the instructor for our MOOC and the one who's kind of put this all together. Uh, I am the course assistant, Ryan Sagar, with uh, the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americans. I'm the coordinator of distance learning, so I've been working closely with uh, Andrew in helping to organize this course. And before we get started with this Google Hangout, uh, just a little bit about these guys. Hadley is well known in the art community for creating the suite of packages known as Tidyverse, which is primarily what students in this course have been using to work with data. Uh, Wickham, uh, Wickham is currently the chief scientist, which I love that title, at our studio and an adjunct professor of statistics at the University of Auckland, Stanford University and Rice University, a uh, uh, very big, uh, uh, great titles. And of course, Andrew Baytran, the instructor for this MOOC and who works with data visualization and R at the Washington Post. Before I turn it over to you guys, I do want to say we have some Amazing opportunities if you guys have not uh, have not uh, signed up for our courses that are coming up. Um, Andrew's course, of course, ends this week. You'll still have access to a lot of the course material as I'm verifying students. Um, also, Andrew has his site, which will have all the materials forever, so you can always be able to access that. And coming up, we have two courses, uh, one starting this week and another starting next week, and you can take those simultaneously. It's One is called Listen Up, How to Launch and Grow a Hit Podcast. That's for August 20th um, to September 23rd. We have five podcast experts. Uh, so if you're interested in podcasting, you gotta take this course. Also, we have the following week starting Introduction to Mapping and GIS for Journalists, uh, two people at the Tribune uh, talking about maps, showing people how to use map to tell, maps to tell stories. But anyhow, enough of that. Um, uh, of course, those courses are free. This course is free. I'm going to turn it over to these guys. Um, so it's all to you guys. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. And I am going to disappear. <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Hadley, thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak to us today. Um, so I guess I guess well, we're going to go over a few uh, questions that folks have sent over. And if anyone else has any other questions, please just uh, uh, you can either tweet it at me or 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 put it into the group group chat. Um, but we've gathered some from the discussion board and the Facebook group. And I suppose, uh, let's see, the first question. Um, let's see. Um, oh, so uh, one person said, um, the, the challenging thing about Tidyverse is that things are always evolving and changing. Uh, and so which functions or aspects uh, do you wish more people would use or know about? So one function that's not that new, but is super helpful and not enough people know about is case when. So like often, which you basically use if you want, instead of doing like a bunch of if else nested if else statements. And so it makes it really easy to do kind of fairly complicated transformations across multiple variables. So sometimes you see people using like if else inside if else inside if else inside if else. Uh, and you can replace that with one case win, which is much, much easier to understand. And so what is the best way to give feedback on packages? Or is it by filing uh, a GitHub issue or tweeting at people? I think issues are the best way. Um, so not only like filing an issue, but um, also like plus oneing or thumbs upping issues that are important to you. Um, let me, I can share. Let me share my screen. Uh, this. Okay, can you see my currently empty Chrome? Yep. yep. Okay. So one thing we, we did fairly recently is um, we made this dashboard, which you can actually see too. It's not really secured anyway. Um, if I can make this. It didn't go away. Um, oops. And you can see it has a list of like all of the open issues. And so one of the things we sort by, yes, 
I've never looked at this in Chrome before and the heading seems to be cutting off something I need to show you. So I'm just going to quickly open this up in Safari. Instead, hopefully the payoff will be worth it. Okay, so. Ah. Stop that screen share. Share. Instead. Okay. So this is the Tidyverse dashboard. And so we have this issue. Ah. Okay, I just have to make it really wide, I guess. Uh, and you can see one of the columns is the number of thumbs ups. So we, we're often going to look at this and be able to sort of say, like, hey, what are the issues that uh, most people, the most people have kind of thumbs up. So it's not like it's not like a popularity contest. It's not like we only work on the most popular things, but this is just sort of one of the signals that we look at, like what are people struggling with? What do they, what do they care about? So creating a new issue, GitHub issue is great if it doesn't already exist. So is thumbs up in an existing issue. Uh, and I think like, you know, tweets are fine, but they're obviously quite short and they don't give a lot of context. Um, so like using a tweet to like draw someone's attention to something that exists elsewhere might be useful. Got it. So, uh, so for everyone in the, in the course, we are going to be uh, learning how to use Git and GitHub. Uh, and so this is what Hadley is referring to. Like there's a lot of, uh, you can go to the actual packages that people have created and go to issues, submit uh, questions or suggestions, or even submit pull requests. And, uh, and then you can thumbs up stuff that you want to, uh, to increase visibility of stuff for. All right. Um, so, so how do you, it's, you, you went to NICAR earlier this year. And I mean, what has your kind of experience been like kind of witnessing the entire, I mean, R has really been growing in popularity, of course, uh, you know, very much thanks to, to, uh, to Dplyr and other, other things that seem to be making it easier. Uh, what has your kind of um, experience been like seeing the growth of R in popularity or, or in usage? It, it just still sort of like, it blows my mind. Like when I started using R, it was sort of this weird little niche language that only like statisticians used and no one else had ever heard about it. And even in like statistics, like people didn't really kind of talk about their code that much. It was more about the, you know, the mathematical statistics and fitting models and stuff and not about how you actually did it using software. Um, so it's been like really, really exciting for me just to see R uh, like explode in popularity and to be used in so many different domains. And I, I kind of like, I particularly enjoy sort of seeing R uh, and, and in general sort of like, like quantitative thinking and like data science skills kind of move out into disciplines that like traditionally have not been that quantitative. Like I, I, I think it's sort of, I think it's fair to say that most people be don't become journalists because they love maths and programming. Um, but it turns out that those are like really useful skills for kind of understanding the world and what people are doing. And I think it's just so exciting to see people like grappling with these issues and then bringing all of these like really great skills and interests and, and techniques that like statisticians don't have, but like journalists do, which I think is, is, is really cool for like, it's, I, I enjoy it cause I learn a lot too. Hmm. Um, so someone had a question in the Facebook group. What is, what's your favorite band and what's the best music to write R to? So I don't, I don't know. I don't really have a favorite band. It's uh, disappointing. I just like basically pick some kind of like fairly upbeat poppy playlist on Apple music and listen to it. That's my usual technique. Or if I'm trying to normally, like if I'm, if I'm like writing a book or something, I don't listen to music. Or if I do listen to music, I pick something that doesn't have English lyrics. Otherwise it interferes a bit too much with thinking, but I do like also just, I don't know, when I'm coding, play some pop music, something, you know, upbeat, kind okay. of energetic. <laughs> okay. Next question from the group. Um, Oh, where do you see R going? 
Uh, and what would you love to see contributors focus on building or expanding on in the next one to five years, uh, particularly in the realm of mapping? I think, yeah, for like for mapping in particular, I, I think, I mean, in a general really, like, there's a lot of things where the kind of the pieces are all there. And if you're like really dedicated, you can take those pieces and assemble them into something amazing. But it like might take you a bunch of Googling and stack overflow questions and like banging your head against the wall. And so generally what I'm interested in is how can you know people kind of take these pieces that are kind of annoying and high friction and like you know wrap them up into packages and make them easy to use and like document the way they work. Um, because I think that's like one of the neat things about sort of our ecosystem is that people are contributing from all these different domains, like solving all of these different problems. Um, and a lot of those, you know, most most of the people using R and most of the people writing packages are like not professional software developers or software engineers. And so I think like there's a, there's, that's, that's to me like one of the most awesome things about R. It can also be like one of the scariest things as well, because you're using code maybe that isn't, hasn't been written by someone trained in computer science, but instead by someone who's like, you know, a great social scientist or a, um, a great biologist. Um, and so I think like, I'm just really excited. Like one of the things I spend a lot of my time is thinking about like, how can we help people who want to write package R packages kind of like upskill? Like how can we make it as easy as possible to write an R package? And then how can we like make sure you kind of learn the smallest amount of like software engineering best practices so that you feel like kind of confident um, using the package. And so that, that just all that kind of like making sure all these like pieces fit together, like really smoothly. Some of that, you know, me and my team work on directly. And then there's just this huge ecosystem of other packages. that I think, that, you know, hopefully over time get, get better and better and easier and easier to use. Great. Okay. Um, and so, um, another student had a question would be interesting to know more about the possibilities for creating interactive visualizations for web with our, I mean, that's a whole new like domain, right? Like before it was like very much only static and now everyone's attaching stuff like leaflet and, and now I think Mapbox. Um, what, yeah. what do you think is next? So I think like for sort of ex exploratory stuff, like for yourself or for your kind of team, like I think Shiny provides a really good toolkit for that. And I think part of the reason why like interactive visualizations are so hard i think is because often the challenge is not like the visualization it's like getting the data into the right shape getting it tidied up getting it clean and then getting it all nicely organized so you can visualize it um, and so r like makes a really good environment for that and then you can kind of couple that with shiny to start making you know any kind of interactivity you can imagine pretty easily but that relies on having like r running in the background which you know if you want to be on the front page of a newspaper and have tens of thousands of people look at it um like it's certainly possible to do that but it ends up being kind of expensive because you can have a bunch of r servers so the, so the other thing um you know that, that people like are these sort of interactive graphics that are just you know purely javascript but there's no r running and I think like by far and away, the, the easiest way to do those with R is with um, the Plotly package, which actually you can you can keep, if you already know how to use ggplot2, you can keep, you can basically use the same ggplot2 syntax and then just like Plotlyfy it at the end and turn it into an interactive graphic, um, mm -hmm. which I think is, is, is pretty neat. Um, it sort of starts to get, you know, the, the more you want to customize your interactive graphics, like the more JavaScript, uh, you need to know which, you know, it's good, good to learn, but there can be like a, a stumbling block if you're just trying to get something out the door. Gotcha. Um, so what what do you think are the most common things data journalists should know when using R? <laughs> it's a <laughs> very broad question. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna say, I, I think like one of the most important kind of skills that anyone should have really is the ability is like knowing how to get help. Um, and I think like a big part of that is like kind of knowing how to frame your problem to make it as easy as possible for other people to help you. 
And one of the things that I think is really that that's really neat and has happened that's sort of been created fairly recently uh, in the art community is the Reprex package by Jenny Bryan. So Reprex is short for a reproducible example. It's basically a package um, that allows that allows you to kind of take a snippet of code and rerun it. Uh, like in a completely independent session. So it makes it possible for you to like take, you know, you've got this big complicated problem, you have big complicated analysis, lots of stuff going on. Reprix allows you to kind of like hone in on a, you know, gradually like figure out exactly, um, exactly where the problem is and then make sure you can easily share it with someone else. And often like in the course of making a reproducible example, and this is the other thing that's great about making a reproducible example, is that often in the course of doing this, like making your question, so uh, someone else can answer it, you'll often end up like answering it yourself. Hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so I see some questions in the, uh, in the Google Hangout. Let's see. Um, so Tiernan asks, most R packages are a collection of related tools. Oh, let me switch this out. Uh, related tools and functions, but can a single project be organized as a package for maximum reproducibility and documentation? Uh, it, it can be, uh, I, and I think it's probably a good idea, although the tools at the moment are a little bit um, fragile and hard to work with. Um, so my sense is in like a couple of years time when the um, the tooling's a little bit more mature. I think that would be a really good idea. Like you can do that now. Like if, I mean, basically if you are asking that question, that probably means you are capable of doing it. Um, if that's something you're worried about, you know, I think it's, I think it's a good idea. But if you're sort of just getting, you know, if you're, if you're a newer user of the R and you, you want to make your project reproducible, it's still a little, I think it just feels harder than it should be to me. Okay, and another question from Nubia. Uh, there is a is there a good website where beginners can ask questions about R because the answers on Stack Overflow are often too advanced to understand. Yeah, so I think I'm kind of hopeful. Like Stack Overflow has been putting a lot of work lately into becoming like more friendly and welcoming to newcomers. So I'm kind of hopeful that you know that that you that you will feel more comfortable asking those sort of more basic questions on Stack Overflow. And I think like if you see an answer, if you see a question on Stack Overflow and you you don't understand the answer, like I think that's that's a problem with Stack Overflow and the people ans answering the questions, not with you. Um, but until that happens, the other place which we have kind of set up like explicitly to be friendly and welcoming to, to newcomers is the R Studio community site. So I, you know, I don't, we're not going to guarantee that you'll get your question answered, but at least there, I think you'll find people who will like um, sympathize with you and at least you know share their experiences and try and work together to to get a solution. Got it. Okay. Um, I think we have. Oh, the last I think overall question is: uh, any advice for people who want to learn R but are intimidated? because they have no programming experience? So I think the best, so first of all, like even people with like no programming experience are like, to, it's totally possible to learn R. Uh, and I think like when you learn R, it's easy to get frustrated and think like, oh, it's me. Like I, I just not capable of learning this, but like everyone who tries to learn R, no matter how smart they are, or no matter how familiar they are with other programming languages, gets like frustrated when they get started. So like, don't let that initial frustration put you off. Um, it, it happens to absolutely everyone and it's gonna happen for a while, but the good news is that it get, gets better over time. So like I, my first piece of advice is like be, like acknowledge that like you're gonna get frustrated, it's gonna be annoying and that's, you know, it happens to everyone. And then I think related to that, like I think the best thing you can do is find other people like you and learn together. Because like learning with friends just like makes it just the, the whole experience like so vastly more enjoyable. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how to suggest how to find those people. Like one, one, per, one way um, 
However, there's an R for data science community. So if you're working your way through the, my R for data science book, there's actually a community site, which I've had nothing to do with, called, which is awesome. We've called the R for data science community. And there, like, people are, are you know, working together to, 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 to learn data science and R. Um, and they've also organized this really neat thing on Twitter called Tidy Tuesday. So it's a hashtag. And every Tuesday, they tweet out, like, a little data analysis challenge, which is normally, like, you know, an hour or two of work. And you can, you know, have a go and then share your results on Twitter. So it's, it seems like a really, really neat idea to me. And and how did you get into R originally? So uh, it was kind of, I don't know, it was kind of inevitable. I was doing my undergraduate in statistics at the University of Auckland, which was the home of R. So um, pretty much every class, every statistics class I taught used R. Uh, I think I had one that used SAS, which I did not enjoy very much, but they all pretty much used R. Um, and I just, I, I think one of the, the one of the reasons that I, I got into it is I had a sort of a, uh, you know, fairly decent kind of programming background. And I was also doing my bachelor's in computer science at the same time. And one of the things that I found kind of appealing about R is that it was just like so it was so weird and like so different to anything I'd used before, but it was clearly so useful to this group of people. And it it really it that that kind of like weirdness like got me and got me intrigued and made me want to like, like figure out like why is R this way? What makes it what makes it special? All right. Well, yeah, we really appreciate all the work you've you've uh, you put into it and making everything open source. And, and available for everyone else. I think we are, okay, I think the question section is done and I've uh, kind of given you a little bit of a data challenge. Yep. Uh, I, it, it involves pulling uh, financial, personal financial disclosures from the uh, US uh, Office of Government Ethics from the executive branch. Yep, so I am just gonna reorganize slightly and then share my screen. So I've done like a little bit of preparation for this, uh, just to make sure that this isn't 30 minutes of me sobbing into the computer. Um, but basically, I, I've just kind of like looked to make sure I think I can do something. But otherwise, this is going to be a pretty like live data analysis and I will sort of like try and talk you through my thinking and Andrew just like feel free to chime in if anything doesn't make sense or you have any questions or I do something too quickly. Sure thing. Okay so um, Andrew sent me two uh, pages about public financial disclosure reports. One is alphabetical order and one is by date. I'm just gonna skip the scary Morning. And these, I think, Andrew, these can, these pages contain the same information, right? They contain the same reports. Yeah, I, I would focus on the annual and then 2018 ones. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like these ones. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the and the goal is basically, yeah. Let's just if we just dig into one of these. Um, you see, this is I have. This is a PDF that has a bunch of information about this person and who they got money from and where their retirement savings are, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's kind of two goals. Like the first goal is to just get a copy of all of these PDFs locally, because um, you can see there's a bunch of them here, and ideally you wouldn't have to go through and click through like every single one of those. Oh, okay, that's quite a lot. And then once we have downloaded them, like, can we figure out how to turn those PDFs into some data that we can analyze somehow? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm gonna do first is, so when I look at this page, I feel like kind of fairly, it, it, this data looks like it's in a table, which is good news, because if you've got a table full of data, it, it's much easier to get started. And so what, if you're skinny scraping anything from the, um, the web, it's good to get familiar with like the inspector in your web browser. Um, and so here's an inspector. And you can see this is just like revealing the, the tree like structure of HTML. And you can see like luckily, yes, this all is in the table. Okay, so that's good news. So now I'm gonna have a go at getting that table into R. 
And to do that, I'm going to use the Arvest package. Hopefully, I remember how to use this. And I'm going to start just by getting this. Uh, what's it called? Uh, let's read HTML. Let's read HTML. Where is that? And I've forgotten how to use this clearly. <laughs> We can use this. Yeah, it's giving me a warning, but read HTML doesn't seem to exist, which is odd. Oh, maybe I'm supposed to use XML to read HTML now. Maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Anyway, so I've now got a copy of this. Page, all I managed to do is basically download it and so I can access it from R. And then because it has a table in it, my life's kind of easier. I can use this HTML table function, hopefully. And I'm just going to call this table. Let's see if that works. And then I'm going to view that. Okay, so it contains a list, which is my table. Okay, so let's. So basically, there might be multiple pages, multiple tables on a page, and I just want to get the first one. And then I'm going to turn this into a tibble just because, oops, why don't I load the tidy bits? That's going to make my life easier. I'm going to turn it into a tibble because that's going to make it easier for me to print out. And so you can see this, this looks pretty good, right? You can see the date. Let's make this wider. You can see the date. You can see the name of the report, Department of Justice, who it's from. Oh, so one problem, though, is that it doesn't actually have the link to the HTML. So for that, we're going to have to use a different. Let's okay. Let's okay. So let's. But 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 before we do that, let's just. I'm just going to name this. Name these columns. So we've got date. We've got report name department and position, I guess. So I'm just going to name those just so when I deal with it later on, it's going to be a little bit easier. OK, and then the other thing I have to do is I have to figure out where all of these links go to. And I think, OK, and so, so one way of doing that, which I use a lot, uh, which hopefully I have in this browser, is this app called Selector Gadget. So what's really neat about Selector Gadget, which I think I need to reinstall it, Selector Gadget. Uh, there go. Just updating it. It's a little bookmarklet. So when I load Selector Gadget. A uh, quick question from the audience. Oh. What's the difference between a tibble and a table? Uh, so a tibble, so basically the, the main difference is like when you print it, it only prints the first 10 rows. So these are like data, like if you if this is an ordinary data frame in R, it prints out all of the rows, which is kind of frustrating. Um, the other thing you'll notice it does is it truncates long strings. So you can kind of see more columns that, that fit on a page. Um, so it's just like it just make turning into a, a table just makes it a little bit easier um, when you're exploring the data. It doesn't you don't end up printing like 400 pages of information to the screen. Okay. Okay. So I'm here, and the neat thing about um, select a gadget is what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to click on the thing that I want to extract, and it's going to come up with kind of a candidate expression, uh, and so you can see it's kind of got some false positives. So I, don't, I only want the links in here. I don't want the links at the top. So I can say, don't pick those. And then it comes up with a new rule. And that rule looks pretty good. So the rule is expressed as a CSS selector, which is basically saying, look for a something in the HTML that has an ID called index, and then find all of the A tags or the link tags inside of that. 
So now in page, we can say uh, HTML node. Let's just see if this works. Okay, that's perfect. And so you can see this is going to extract 942 links. And then I want, this gives me the A tag, which has the, like, the place that it links to, the text. And then from that, if I do this, I want to extract the href attribute, which has the link. Okay, so I now have like 942 links. And hopefully, hmm, so I have 942 links, but I only have 941 rows in this table, which is a little sad. <laughs> uh, so look, so I've got an extra link somewhere. Oh, I bet one of these has two links. So what I'm going to do instead, I think, let's see, this is 942. Oh, so I'm going to, so yeah, so I think let's see if this works. So what I'm going to do is instead of starting with a link, I am going to start with the table cells. I don't want the table cells. I'm going to start with the table rows. And hopefully, there are 941 of those. Okay. So now I'm going to say, so I've got 941 rows. And now I'm going to say, give me the first link inside each row. And I have 941 links. That's good. And now I'm going to say, give me the URL. And I have 941 links still. So good, that's good. Okay, so now I'm going to put those inside my table and I'm just going to call that URL. If we look at this table, I've got all this information and I've got the URL. And I think you said, um, Andrew, that we only mostly care about the annual report for 2018. Yeah. So I'm going to filter it just to look at those. I'm going to just try first of all, actually, before I do that, let's just check what they all are. I'm just going to count them up. So it looks like there is 27 annual reports. Now, what I would be worried of, one thing I always worry about here, which I'll, is that, you know, so at this, we're basically looking for this string, right? Annual space, open parentheses, 2018, close parentheses. But one thing I often worry about is sometimes you have like a space at the end <laughs> and there's like no way to see that here. Like you can't tell that there's a space. So it's a good idea just to look at, I'm just gonna look at all of them and just kind of skim down to see if there are any others that maybe I'm gonna miss. So you can see there's a lot of these 278 transactions. Um, so maybe what I should have done is just do like table filter. I want to find anyone that contains annual. Check that works. Yeah, count report. I'm just going to making sure. Okay, so that so I'm fairly confident that if I just do exactly those letters i'm going to get the right thing so let, let's do that now uh what was what's the shortcut you used to uh because the, the students are noticing you're, you're writing the assign uh simple very quickly like this so, or like oh so, yeah that's I, oh yeah that one was well, some of that is just that i type really quickly <laughs> um <laughs> but there is a keyboard shortcut and that's mm -hmm. alt um alt minus and sorts and sets the assignment arrow and okay. command shift M and search for pipe. <laughs> okay, so I've got all of these and then I could just pull out those URLs. And now I want to download them somewhere. 
So if I'm going to download them, let's just, uh, I'll call this annual 2018. Just going to save that. And I can get the, what's another way, URL. So I want to save these. And if I'm going to save them, like I'm going to want to come up with like a file name. And so I think just using the same file name here. Uh, and I think the easiest, let's just try, uh, what's it called? It's called base name, I think. Yeah. So I can use this base name function, which I happen to know about. Um, so, and then I'm going to say, well, where do I want to save them? I'm just going to call, I'm just going to put this in a directory, paste zero. I'm just going to call it PDFs. Okay. Okay. That's my path. Let's just clean this up a little bit. Okay. And now I want to download each one of those files. So there's a, I always forget what it's called. It's called download file. Ah, download file. Download file, which takes a single URL and a single destination path. And I've got a bunch of um, files and a bunch of URLs. So if you're just getting like one way to solve this would be with a for loop. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip like three steps ahead and I'm going to use this function called map to. And what map to is designed to do is basically take, well, actually, I'm going to call use something called walk to. Um, it's going to take these URLs, these paths, it's going to call download.file once for each pair of URL and path. And before I need to, before I do that, I'm going to create this PDF directory. So before I explain any more, I'm just going to run this code to make sure it actually works. Okay, and you can see it appears to be working. So this is the way to avoid doing loops. Exactly. And so I realize I'm I have created this inside my home directory, which is perhaps not the best place to be working. But... Oh no. <laughs> Uh, while this is looping, there was another yes. one from uh, from Jay. Um, yep. When you are designing new families of functions, like highly specific functions in Per, are you developing for defined problem classes or to extend along possible data structures? Uh, I mean, I would say yes. Um, so, like, part of the motivation is like. I kind of like keep track of like little problems that seem like they should be kind of hard. They they feel harder than they should be. And uh, I talk to people and they you know they tell me what they're struggling with. And um, so that's kind of part of it, like knowing what like specific problems that need to be solved. And generally, kind of like I um, I spend a lot of um, it. It like takes a long time, but kind of before like enough problems kind of accumulate. To, to figure out like what the class of solutions would be. Um, so there's so there's that. And then I also kind of think like I read a lot about other like programming languages. And I kind of I really like making like little tables. Like so for example, um, you know, there's like in this case there's like map and map to and walk to. And then you know sometimes you want the output to be a list and sometimes you want the output actually. This is, table looks more like this. You've got one argument that's changing. You've got two arguments that are changing. You've got n arguments that change. If you want a list, well, that's going to be map. If you have two arguments and you want a list, it's going to be map two. And like, mm -hmm. this is a p map. So I kind of like construct these little tables and try and make sure like every cell is filled. So thinking about like all of the possible combinations and like, can we? Can we solve them all in, in one foul swoop? Okay, so we've downloaded them all. Let's just click on one to take a look. Get that out of the way. So I've downloaded them all and now I have got a bunch of PDFs. Now I have, now I have like the next problem, which is I have 28 PDFs and I need to extract some information from them. So this is, um, 
far from my area of expertise, but I did a little um, Googling yesterday, and I think there's two packages that you should start with. The first one is Tabulizer, um, which is a wrapper around this Java program. Then the other is our PDF tools. So I think you want to start with Tabulizer because it is designed specifically to extract tables out of PDFs. And so if this works, you're kind of you're, you're good. And so we want to extract tables. And I'm just going to start with one file. So let's just call it path. Let's use PDFs. And so tabulizer is going to do its thing. Um, OK, and it's done its thing. So I've got this object back. Uh, I don't know what type of object that is. Uh, whenever that happens to me in R, I either use str or I use view. So tables, or I use view. And so you can see this is a list of length one. So that presumably implies that it loaded one table. And each table is like a matrix. So let's just extract that tables. Take a look. And so you can kind of see, let's now we'll try and I'm gonna try and rearrange my screen a little so you can hopefully see that. And the script will be available after, I hope. Yes, unless I accidentally delete it between now and then, which will hopefully okay. not happen. Okay. Okay, so here is the first table. That's and so you can it. see this this looks kind of promising, right? You can kind of see we've got each cell on the table and it's kind of lined up. Like we have this little problem. Oops. You can see like College, university college has got split up into two lines. But this seems like a kind of maybe a, and we've got like kind of two tables jammed into this table. Mm. But this seems like, you know, maybe a, a worthwhile place to start. So let's, let's do that. So let's take out this, we'll call it lines. Um, I think I can, can I turn this into a table? So I'm going to turn into a tibble again, just this makes it easier to print. Uh, I'm going to call this Acosta. Oops. Acosta, it's probably going to, that's a terrible idea to call it that because I'll systematically type it wrong every single time. And then again, I'm just going to name those variables. So it looks like the first column is organization name and then type and then position. And then um, and so then the next thing I want to do, I think, let's just view this again. Is like what's happened is I think we've actually got multiple tables in here. So I think a good place to start is to try and like just just work on a single table. And so I think if we go back to the PDF, you can kind of see we've got these headings, like one, file is position, two, file is employment. So what I'm going to do, I think, is just find those positions. So like line, uh, we'll call this line table one, and I think a costa org. And I'm going to use str something. Uh, str which, yes, str which. And so str which is going to tell me all the lines that match a pattern. And that pattern I'm going to look for is one dot filers. So, you know, if you're doing this for like, there's no, there's no good way to do this. Like, you just have to try something and then see how it works. Like you're going to have, you might have some false positives, you might have some false negatives, but like get something that works for one document. Uh, David asked a quick question. 
is there a reason you're using names instead of pipe set names? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, just because I guess that's, yeah, I, I'm. It's what you're used to. Yeah, it's what I'm used to. I'm still, yeah, I don't use all of them. Tidyverse all the time myself, and I sometimes forget what they are. Um, so then we're going to find the next line. Uh, let's switch back to PDF. So it's oh, okay. So it's filers employment. I'm going to make these slightly longer to make it a little easier to remember. Okay. So we want the lines of Acosta. And if you're going to do this 100% tidyverse, you could use um, slice. So I want from the first line, like not including that line, because that line's the header, to one before the other line, because that line's also the header. And that doesn't want to work for some reason. Oh, maybe you have that filter. Filter shouldn't. Uh, oh, yeah. It's not grouped. Mm, I might have forgotten how to use. Huh. <laughs> that might be a bug and slice. So I'm going to take it a different way. I'm just going to. Yeah. I got a different way. I'm just going to use. I don't need slice anymore. I'm just going to use uh, old school subsetting. Old school base. Right. And I, that makes me realize I forgot to name this last column. So I'm going to fix that too. <laughs> so this is, I think this is like really, this is really typical. Like when you're doing a data analysis, you're writing code, you kind of like jump around quite a bit. And like and that's fine um the the main thing is to like i think like get it working and then come back and do like a part another path through where you like kind of comment it so you can remember what what you're doing and you can come back to it in the future but now i think we've got a decent subset and i think actually i want to drop out the second i want to do slightly more narrow it's out. Oh, uh, David is asking, what exactly are you doing with line table one and two and then subsetting? You're, you're, you're pretty much going to limit the table, right? Right. So I'm trying to, if we go back to this PDF, that that table I got into R basically had everything on the first page. And I think it's like whenever you're tackling a big problem like this, it's, I think you should just start with like ruthlessly narrowing down the problem until you can actually solve it. So I'm like ruthlessly narrowing it down to just get one single table worth of data. Mm. And I seem to have done that. And so I was just adjusting these offsets here to say basically how many lines do I want to trim. And I'm just going to do it. I'm just doing that until I don't see any empty lines at the top or the bottom. Mm. So now we have the next problem which is some of these lines are not are actually just carried over from the previous line. Like this line with a type is GE. Like clearly what I should be doing is pasting that together with the, the previous line. And so I'm just going to call this Acosta 2, which is not a very good name, but it's better than nothing. Actually, I should call this Acosta position. Because this is that that first table is about his position. His position. Okay. And so now I need some way of um, combining these two lines. And I'm pretty sure uh, I tweeted about this, and Andrew liked the tweet, and now I can't remember how it worked. But um, I think I'm going to do I something with. And let me pull it up. Um, so while you do that, I'm going to just try and I'm going to make a new line. I'm just a new variable. I'm just going to call it carry over. And I'm going to say it's carried over. It looks like if two equals an empty string. 
Uh, you use mutate, fill, and filter, and you use direction up or down. Fill and direction. Uh, this is a slightly different problem, isn't it? Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, so let me, I'm just gonna write some code, and then if it works, I'll try and figure out how to explain it. I just have a, some intuition about how this might work. Well, there's one. Mm. You did if else and X and A, and then fill direction, and then filter is an A. Uh, yeah, so let's create another call. I'm gonna call this type two. I'm gonna fill type two up. Yeah, like this. Uh, and then I'm just gonna make this a little easier. I'm just gonna narrow it down to look at these two. Fill apply to type. Oh, whoops, it's, that's not how it works, is it? Uh, type two is, okay, yes, now, okay, it's slowly coming back to me. If it's a carryover, mm. I want to use type, otherwise I want a missing value. Okay, and let's see how that worked. Okay, so all I have managed to, to do <laughs> is put this and this and okay, now I can and now I'm just going to show you those two columns. So now you can see basically all I've managed to do is kind of put it in its own column to the side. And when it isn't carried over, I've got NAs. And so now what I can do is fill type two up. Direction. Okay, and this is common. I forget how to use my own functions. Dot direction. Dot direction. That would make sense. Okay. So now you can see I've got them on the same line. And now I can say make, I'm going to, I'll just call it type three so you can see what's going on. I'm just going to combine type and type two. And then put this in there. So you can see there's like some lines where I've ended up with nonsense. Um, but I'm going to get rid of that line anyway, so I don't really care. So let's just kind of look at the whole thing again. And so I've just solved it for one, and I'm just going to leave it there so you basically get the idea. But I'm going to then say, Filter where I don't want any carryovers anymore, like that, and then I want to get rid of um, type and type two. And I now have the type all combined in one one line. Oh. So. At this point, like I don't know exactly what I have done, but it seems to have worked. Um, and so now, like if I was doing a real analysis, I would like sit down and kind of think like that. That, that seemed to require like a lot of steps. Um, and some of those steps I kind of put in to, to kind of explain my thinking, but I think some of them, may, like maybe like now that I've solved it, like it's a good opportunity to kind of go back and say like, could I solve this better in some way? Um, before I go on to the next challenge. Um, but we've only got like five minutes left. So I think I'll I'll stop there. Um, I'll save the script. Um, let me just put it, I'll put it on my desktop and then I'll share it with Andrew. Um, what what were these forms called again, Andrew? What were these? Um, financial disclosures. Okay, financial disclosure. Okay, and I'll save that so I can share it. Um, but I wanna just like, stop there like I certainly haven't solved the whole problem but hopefully you can kind of see like one thing I did to like make this problem tractable was to just like narrow in again and again and again to like solve one little problem and I have managed to solve that I've got like one table uh, with one variable 
pet looks good. Uh, and now like I would go on and you know, that, that took me a while and it would take, take you longer if you're not so familiar with R, but like, you know, you'll get better and better as you do tackle more and more of this problem. So this is the first table out of all those uh, PDFs you downloaded. Yeah. Uh, how would you just create one big oh, yeah. data frame for all, for the rest of the PDFs with that just, if you were just trying to get that one table out of all those PDFs. Yeah, so the next thing I would do is kind of extract it. I would say, well, let's do this in general. So let's make a PDF, uh, let's make a function out of this. Um, I would probably start with this. Like I've solved it for one problem, now I want to generalize it. So I put it into a function. I wouldn't call it a coster anymore, but oops, I changed that eventually. So this takes a line from that PDF. And so then I would start, uh, I have to go back up here. So I'd do something like this, PDFs, I'll say, tell me all of the PDFs, tell me all the files in this PDF directory. And then I would say, give me, take all of those PDFs, and I want to map, extract all of the P, uh, whoops, I'll call this paths. So this is going to call tabulizer extracts table on every single one of those PDFs. And then I would do like, like my apply my table one function to them. And then since eventually I don't want a list, I'm going to want a data frame, I'd use like map data frame row, which joins all the output. So you can see now I've loaded all these PDFs. Uh, oh. There's something wrong there, but the basic, yeah. So the basic idea, like solve it for one, generalize it to a function, use the functions in per like map and walk and map df to apply it to every single one of these files. Then often when you're doing that, you'll discover an error. You'll have to like go back, revise your function, run it again, you'll get a different error. Go back, revise it again, you'll get another error. And like after doing that like eight times, you'll finally have like a nice clean um, data frame which you could then plot or whatever. Right. It's so much faster overall than doing it, extracting it by hand for every PDF. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, our time is up, and I really thank you so much for uh, for walking us through this, this data challenge. It's something that a lot of journalists have to deal with uh, regularly. So it's, it's very cool that uh, you're able to, to walk us through your process. And be before you guys go, uh, first of all, thank, thanks both of you guys for taking the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, Hadley, I know that you have a conference coming up. Is that correct? Uh, that's going to be here in Austin, I believe. Did we lose him? I think so. <laughs> oh, wait, he's coming back. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to just hang up on you. That was yeah. So I, I, I've got... Is, is it true, Hadley, that you have, uh, I, would, uh, I was talking to Andrew before you, we got on with you, you have your R Studio conference, which I think you guys should be able to see on my screen, share right now, and that's coming up. Can you just tell us a little bit about that before you get going? Yeah, sure. So it is uh, two days of training, two days of conference. Um, it's like our attempt to make like the best four days of learning about R you could possibly ever have. Um, personally, like in some sense, it's kind of like my favorite conference in the sense that I have enough control that I can make sure it has none of my conference pet peeves, um, which is things like we'll make sure all the badges are double sided so you never have your name facing your chest and your blank side facing the other people. <laughs> you know, you know your name, and then like we, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fairly small conference, it's three tracks. We try and make sure that like all of the speakers, like my goal when making with our goal in making the program is at every single slot you should feel genuinely conflicted about which session to attend um and though that said we we do record all of the um all of the sessions you can see the videos from last year but just as it's a great i think it's a great conference and it's like great because you're there with like 
1500 other like fans of R, lovers of R. And it's just, it's a really, really fun conference. Sounds like a great place for networking. I also, before you guys go, obviously we can find you guys. I think this is you right here, yep. right, Hadley? Yep. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Hadley Wickham on Twitter. We've also got uh, A.B. Tran uh, right here. Uh, and uh, thanks again, guys. And remember, for all you guys watching, you can, of course, come to journalismcourses.org to, to sign up for other courses, courses similar to like what Andrew's been doing. Thanks again, guys. Do uh, you have anything else you want to end with? Yeah, I'm totally funny for Darla Cameron's uh, mapping course. She's a former colleague of mine. She's amazing. She's at the Texas Tribune. You'll, you'll learn a lot all about GIS and mapping through her. So. Oh, that's right. I, forgot, I that. forgot that you 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 worked with Darla at the Washington Post. So yeah, <laughs> uh, she, uh, she was the one who uh, helped us figure out what that mascot is on your desk uh, throughout all all of uh, Andrew's cor uh, course. Oh, yeah. work. This is fine, dog. Speaking of dogs, Hadley, what what's the name of your dog back there? Oh, it's Lola. Lola. There's oh. another another dog you can't quite see. <laughs> a pretty calm. Right. You're, you're lucky no one rang the doorbell. <laughs> well, appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. This, of course, will be available uh, if you didn't, if you weren't able to tune in live. Uh, it's Friday. Go out, have fun. It's the weekend. Thanks for having me. Bye, y'all. Cheers, guys.